Welcome to another session of the Warm Book Club. We are going to begin uh, to discuss this book by Hans Urson Balthasar called A Short Primer or Primer for Unsettled Layman. Uh, what is a primer or primer? Well, in German, it's a kleiner Fiebel für unsicken Lion. Anyway, sort of a little, uh, little handbook uh, for people who are confused, which should continue, should be all of us, I suppose. I, I want to, I want to confess right now, I'm, I'm not in exactly the right mood for discussions because just prior to coming here in the studio, I read Peter Kreis' little uh, statement about Thomas Howard, who died a few days ago, and that's on Catholic World Report. Dot com, CatholicWorldReport.com. It is so beautiful. And Tom Howard was such a beautiful man, a real Catholic Christian gentleman uh, who, who wrote masterpieces. Not many, but they were all masterpieces, as, as Crave says. In any event, we are going to be discussing him after this book. I've got the old edition here, Chance of the Dance. There's a newer edition with it, forward by uh, Eric Metaxas, the evangelical radio host and TV host from New York, uh, which is very, uh, very moving also. Anyway, we'll get to that at some point. In the meantime, uh, we'll take sort of the first third of a short primer, Run Settle Lehman. This was published back in 1989 in German, so that's 30 years ago. Uh, but I think it still speaks to problems we have today. And we had... Uh, Angela Frank, uh, who is a, uh, what does it say about her here? Professor of Theology at St. John's Seminary. That's right. And she did this in Easter Monday, 2020. So she herself is quite an impressive person uh, and scholar and writer. And so we had her write a forward just to kind of emphasize the fact that uh, we're not bringing back something which is antiquated, but something which is very timely. And she says on page 7, at the very beginning here, towards the bottom, in this primer, Balthasar addresses today's faithful laity who feel that precisely this solidity of the church is shifting beneath their feet. So there's this sense that what is it you're saying? What does she stand for? What do we have to believe? And so on. And on page 10 and 11 of her foreword, she says, uh, bottom of the page, 11, 10 actually, sorry. This insecure situation marks the church in distinctively new ways because it is doubly unsettling. First, when Christians surrender to the world today, they surrender to the unrealizable demand of self-creation. The faithful laity encounter this insecurity not only in their own spirit, but also in Catholic institutions and persons. As these two accommodate themselves to the liquid spirit of the age, this kind of unstable spirit of the age, everything seems to be shot through with instability. Uh, Did you notice that allusion to Hopkins? I, well, also to herself, but go ahead, explain that. Well, shot through with instability is an allusion to Hopkins' poem, uh, where he, you know, he says things are shot through with the grandeur of God. Do I have the right poem, Joseph? I don't think it's the phrase shot through. This is now, this is now to become a good question. Um, I, I think, isn't it something like sh shines forth? Uh, I'm going to I think I was gonna look it up. If charge the grandeur of God, it will shine out. No, it was something like shining from short foil. I don't think it's. I don't think it's shot through. But I could be wrong. Well, for some reason, when I read that line, I instantly thought of Hopkins' poem. I should have looked it up, and then I forgot about it. But okay. I thought of his poem and thought, instead of everything being shot through with the grandeur of God. It's now shot through with this instability because of the power that modern science and technology gives us to manipulate matter, even down now to micro 
uh, pieces okay. of matter. Now everything's unstable. There's no fixed anything. That That is the existential experience of modern man. And now as Christians, we experience this in the church as well. Anyway, that's what I thought of. Maybe I'm mistaken, but. I think there's shook foil in there too. But Thomas, while we're doing this, Google Hopkins, quote, shot through, close quote. See what you come up with. Uh, I, we also have it in the in the breviary, but I don't have it sitting right here. But. All right, we'll get to that. We don't get it this week. We'll get that for you next week. Yeah. But there's also reference to herself when she talks about the liquid spirit of the age. Because yes. her, her thesis, what is it called? Liquid... Uh, liquid li narcissism. Liquid narcissism, yes. Would you explain, right. explain that, Vivian? <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's a term that she coined... Uh, in a talk that she gave to a von Balthasar conference, Father and I attended together, and she described that um, this this demand for self creation that that people are experiencing, and it being amplified with social media and the ability to create this identity for yourself and project it into the world. Uh, including airbrushing the photographs, right, to make sure you look your best. And uh, so we actually touched on this a little bit when we were discussing um, Cardinal Seurat's book. Um, what's the one that we all discussed together? The night is now far spent. Yes. And uh, because he also was talking about this narcissism and Joseph, you had some very good things to say about that at the time, too, when we brought up this liquid narcissism. Yeah, I mean, I, my, my view for what it's worth is that, you know, if, if you give the devil enough rope, he hangs himself. Um, you know, if you give him enough power, he hangs us first. But but the point is that the technology is, is it's what we're seeing. This narcissism is self-destructive. I mean, the, the, the myth of Narcissus is, is still as appropriate now and uh, as and applicable as it always was be that was the problem is of course there's going to be lots of turmoil and it's going to be seismic and we're going to have, probably have a 21st century which is a complete mess but then the 20th century was a complete mess too so i mean uh, uh, so, so <laughs> what, what you know plus a change right but the uh, ultimate uh uh manifestation of this right now is when School children in California are now being required to decide if they're girls or boys. Talk about the burden of self-creation. I have to figure out if I'm a girl or a boy at the age of five? I mean, nothing's given. Yes, it, well, it, not only not given, but now they talk about, this is a, the corruption of language, that what sex you were assigned at birth, assigned at birth, you don't get your sex assigned to you. It is recorded. It is acknowledged. That's right. And by the way, as far as photoshopping, you know, and, and airbrushing things, Joseph and I actually, in our humility, we actually airbrush ourselves to make us look worse than we actually look in reality. Isn't that right, Joseph? Yeah, whenever anybody sees me in the flesh, I say I look wonderful. Right, what, if what you're seeing now is really, you know, a poor, well, a poor I reflection. think you both need to stop doing this self-creating, even if it's self-destructing. <laughs> okay. Self-deprecation. So, uh, yeah. Anybody, anything else on the forward from uh, Angela Franks? Not on the forward. How about the preface by uh, Balthazar? Not for me. Vivian? Well... I, you know, my biggest problem with this book is that well, I want to underline everything. It, it's interesting. He's very succinct, uh, but he's not. It's it's not so overloaded that you can't appreciate it and understand it. But boy, he really gets to the heart of things. And it's just so packed. Every line uh, is so um, full of things you could talk about. Uh, but the preface, this expression that he uses of, um, he's quoting uh, from 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 St. Paul in Corinthians on the first page of the preface, page 15, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. What is puffed up is hollow. 
what is built up remains. And um, I never thought of that before. The hollowness of something that's puffed up like a, uh, like a, like, like a, um, Cheeto. Oh, what are those things you Brits eat with your beef? Your, uh, a pork your, rinds. uh, pork rinds. popovers, but you call them something pork else. Rinds. Yorkshire pork. puds. Pork, pork rinds, Yorkshire puddings. Yeah. Balloons. I was thinking of balloons. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah, oh. but Yorkshire puddings, <laughs> you know, they're literally, <laughs> they're literally hollow because of the, they getting filled with air, but also like a, a, I don't know why I was thinking of food instead of that, but balloons. <laughs> yes. And so this puffing up and you know what astounds me about von Balbazar? Here is probably one of the greatest geniuses of the 20th century, as far as the church is concerned. Or anything else. Go ahead. And, and he's such a humble man and understands precisely this um, arrogance of, of the man of, of letters who has knowledge and not faith. And, and the destructive influence they've had on theology in the modern time, you know, these people who know all this stuff and are puffed up and yet within have no faith. And that's part of the crisis he's going to talk about. Yes. And on the chapter, which is unnumbered, the situation, we kind of sets the scene, page 19, he starts it off by saying, all true Catholic Christians suffer today from the confusion within their church. Now, that's a statement. I think it's factual. 30 years ago, it was true. I think it's still true today. Yeah. But here's the next sentence. One can safely say that this unrest that followed the council came mainly, italicized now, from the clergy and religious. And I, I lived through that, you know, and, and we did. We spread this confusion. But we talked, we talked about puffed up and balloons. I might be tempted to talk about abscess being puffed up as well, because the consequence of this, um, uh, when Balthasar was writing in the 1980s, of course, came to ugly fruition 10 years later with the, the, the abuse crisis. Right? There, there's, a, there's a crisis of faith. There's a crisis of love. And in consequence, we have this narcissism at the heart of uh, large the large sections of the clergy, and it's played itself out in this destructive way. And you could say that what the cl the clergy were trying to reinvent themselves, recreate yes, for themselves they, a they new identity. They become relativistic. They've actually bought into the spirit of the age. That was the problem. Yep. And he says on page twenty four here, new paragraph at the bottom. Uh, the present situation is characterized by strong polarization, his emphasis in the church, so much so that a dialogue between progressives and traditionalists succeeds only rarely. And unfortunately, that polarization, it seems to me, has only intensified since he wrote these chapters. So we have to, what's the answer? Uh, on page 25, he gives what he thinks the answer is. Where should one look to see a dawn that is out of this darkness. One should look to where the, in the tradition of the church, something truly spiritual appears, where Christianity does not seem a laboriously repeated doctrine, but a break breathtaking adventure. And then he refers to the Albanian woman in Calcutta. And, cer and certainly she and now St. John Paul II were ones that I think revivified uh, the faith in their lives and gave us a, a source of light in a dark period. And I, 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 I'm Benedict the 16th. That's true, yes. But he's writing yes. this in 89, so he, he's, he's not, he's not well, there yeah. yet. But. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, and that's so key for Balthazar, that the faith be something living in the Christian person that it isn't that he thinks doctrine isn't important or that scholarship isn't important or that forms aren't important, liturgical or otherwise. It isn't that they're not important, but if they don't take root in the individual and bear fruit of a life lived for Christ, then it loses its 
it, it loses its potency in the world. The only thing I would say as a, maybe a nuance on that is the problem is not the form, but the formlessness. In other words, it's the abandonment of doctrine, which is actually causing the crisis in faith. There's nothing, the doctrine is alive. You know, orthodoxy is an adventure always. And that the problem is that we are not engaging with the orthodoxy. We're engaging with the relativism. So we, 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 we've substituted form, you know, the, the dogma of the church, for formlessness, the spirit of the age. But I think what he's pointing to as well is that the era in which he's talking about now, before the council, um, where he's talking about, um, and maybe it's not in this chapter, but the formulaic way in which priests, for example, were taught in seminaries, um, that, that um, the, the uh, external conformity, perhaps, to, to rules or penances or things like that, there was, uh, for, for men of his time, there was an ossification that they were experiencing in the church. And you're absolutely right, Joseph, that what was needed was to re-engage with those things as a living love of God. But at that time, for many of these people, that isn't how they were experiencing the Catholic it's faith. True that the seminary, in seminaries, uh, you know, prior to the council, there was clearly was an ossification, and they're clearly going through the motions. And, and again, by their fruits, you shall know them. Because if it, that wasn't the case, you wouldn't see the, the, the mass abandonment of the faith by priests and religious in the 70s. Father, do you have anything to say to that? Um... Well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it because I was in the seminary. I entered the Jesuits in 1961 prior to the council. And so I had my formation, most of it, the early formation prior to the council, and I have to say, I was a, you know, college student in my junior year. I felt the call to the priesthood and the Jesuits, and I, I felt I was leaving things behind, and I, I learned to pray. My master of novices, Father Drennel, was a saint. Uh, when I learned about the history of the Society of Jesus and the doctrine of the church, I mean, I, as long with my fellow seminarians, we were, we were filled with zeal and, and encouragement. I mean, I, I didn't. And we had the bell, we had the bells that rang, you know, bell at five o'clock, you get up, you know, at five thirty, you go to the chapel, and you know, five forty-five, you do this, and and all through the day. And I remember then later on in the late sixties, after the council, going up to the philosophy in Spokane, Washington, and there was a young Jesuit there, since deceased, who was big into psychology, and he was saying, you know. Uh, we've been living like neurotics. I mean, the, the bell rings, we do this. The bell rings, we do that. Our whole life is just, you know, based on uh, this schedule, which is kind of a, a, a ossified form, right? We were taught to learn to listen to the bell as the voice of Christ. If if the bell rings, that means Jesus wants you now to go have lunch. You know, it, it wasn't it wasn't a mechanical thing. Well, it turned out uh, later on, he became ordained. Uh, he never said mass except on rare occasions. Uh, he became an alcoholic. He got on drugs. And so in order to correct him, to, to dry him out, what did they do? They sent him to a place south of, of San Jose, uh, you know, one of these houses where they try and restore your ability to live a good life. And what do they do? They rang a bell at 5.30 and sitting up in exercise. They rang a bell at 8 o'clock. You're going to eat breakfast. And, and my view is, that, you know something? More, for most people, you either get married or you have a religious order with a, a schedule. Because we need to have, when you get married and have children, as you should, you got to get up when it's time to get up. You, you can't say, I'm going to sleep in today, you know, because the kids are crying. And then you got to take them to school and you got to schedule. So... If you're married, then you've got a, an imposed discipline which is required to live the married life in a fruitful way. If you're not married, you need something equivalent. And I think religious life, with its common order, they used to call it, uh, of, of a real schedule, was what we need. Otherwise, we simply, you know, we're liquid. We just 
yeah, like, I, 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 again, I've just returned from Deer Creek Abbey, you know, living with the Benedictine monks just for the weekend. But that, 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 that structure of prayer, you know, is beautiful and the monks are beautiful. And the vast majority of them are young. You know, and and then the, the people that, that that from from around about that come there. This is a fern. This is the furnace of faith, and you know, and a power station of love. I mean, this is this is this is what it's about. I mean, if you the monastic life. Obviously, we're not all called to that. I'm not called to that. But you know, but there's but that I, those are men that are. This is actually exactly what they need, and they're an inspiration to the rest of us. Mm-hmm. I think yes. back, back to your point that Vivian, there was, so to speak, us of his us. Of, how did you say Ossification. <laughs> Ossification, yes. you know, sclerosis in some of the way the doctrine was taught. Uh, in both Balthasar and Dulabach and Rashker himself, uh, they resisted that. They wanted to kind of reinfuse that with a kind of a vitality. Uh, nevertheless, it wasn't, it wasn't like a complete uh, uh, cemetery of only dry bones. And you look upon... I remember part of my vocation was reading what was called the Golden Book of Marianal Missionaries, 1951, by Albert Nevins, a Marianal priest. And I read about these Marianal missionaries in the 40s and 50s that would give up their lives and go to these, uh, you know, the, the, the nun who going to be sent to Africa. She goes to the dentist and said, how are my teeth? Well, you might get some cavities. I don't know. Well, take them out because I won't have a dentist where I'm going. She had all her teeth pulled out, you know. That took place before the council. Wow. Yeah, and, I, and if you look at, I mean, my, my book, Literary Converts, certainly up until 1945, there's a vibrancy in the Catholic Church. Now, the real mystery, all the discussions I've had, no one's ever really, including myself, got a handle on it. You know, something happened between 1945 and 1970, right, that, that, that caused not just in the church, but in the world. Right? right, some sort of collective madness, which is playing itself out as we speak. So, um, uh, th- th- no one's really got got to grips with that yet, and there's something happening then, which really was a revolution that that shook everything, including the church. And and you know, we talk about the, the 60s. Well, what does that mean, right? And 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 clearly, something was happening before the 60s for the 60s to happen in the way they did. So, you know, I, I do think. The two world wars is certainly part of it. I do think the the atomic bomb and the Cold War and, and you know is it, part of it. You know that neurosis we have now because there's a uh, you know a virus going around. Well, you know there was they, they, we still got that nuclear threat above our heads, right? I mean, so I I, 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 I the I other bomb there was the something other bomb? happened in that sort of period between about 1945, the end of World War Two, and um, and 1970, a 25-year period. Well, the other bomb that went off besides the nuclear bomb, the contraceptive pill. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, but yeah. That's, absolutely. But that's why I, w- I would say 1955, because I think, I believe in the greatest generation that there was heroism in the 40s. There was sacrifice, people willing to die. Well, that's and, why I began, I began in 1945, Father, not 1935. Yeah, I no, agree but, but after the war, there was still, I'd say, what, what happened after that, I believe, from 45 to 55, was... Uh, after after all the deprivations and privations of war, we became a flourishing, very affluent society. And so people hadn't lived through the war or hadn't lived through the Depression. All they saw was, was plenty, peace and plenty. We, we got in 1950, we got the beat generation, Kerouac on the road, you know. So, yeah, I, I think that in that period, 45 to 55, there was this movement towards against tradition, uh, over affluence, Jesus says, you know, it's harder for rich men to get to heaven than a camel with the eye of an eel and so on. But I, so I, I, 45 was a good year. 55, I think maybe the rod had set in, but it was, uh, there was still a lot of solidity. There were the large families. There was church, Churches were full, religious orders, a lot of vocations. I mean, when I was a novice in 1961, we had California province alone. There were 10 provinces of the U.S., 104 novices, and that's over a two-year period, so, you know, 52 each. 104 novices. We don't have that many for the whole United States right now. Right, and probably one of those novices was Governor Jerry Brown. Well, that's true, he was. I mean, you know, that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, wait, this has been very fascinating. and it, it, I, I believe it, it, it's related to this book because he's talking it about is. this problem, which raises the confusion 
that people have, including unsettled laymen. Well, what's beautiful about what von Balthasar does is that he gives us the situation and then he goes right to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Well, you, 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 the you, incomparable. You pumped me absolutely by mentioning the name, uh, the holy name. Um, but uh, I, could, could we go back to 21, page 21, which sure. is the first thing I had highlighted here. And I've actually highlighted the word but. Uh, about four lines down the second uh, in in the second paragraph, the first full paragraph in that page. I did too. Yeah, go ahead. So you know, it's a, some of its reformers counsel lighten certain burden, as if that's necessarily a good thing. For example, it abolished mandatory abstinence on Friday, limited fasting, and also simplified the liturgy. But as if the preceding was okay, and no one's no one's going to question it. And I would question that, and I actually rejoice at the fact that the the, uh, the hierarchy of England and Wales have actually brought back abstinence on Fridays. I think that's a step in the right direction, which means that this is a step in the wrong direction. So I think the but there, is, for me, is problematic. And I do think, and I do agree with you, this is as relevant as ever, and I'm delighted with, 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 with that we're, um, there's a new edition that we're discussing it, but that we do have to be aware that it was written in 1989. Um, and uh, and the, the, the things have changed, and not always for the worst either since then, you know? Right. Well, I I think you're right to remind us that this was written in 1989 um, because that but reads differently then than it does now. You know, sometimes you don't see. And also something can be a good pastoral move at a time. And then a little later, the pastoral uh, situation needs to change yet again. So I know that I was not raised a Catholic, but when my father remarried, he married a lapsed Catholic. Okay, this was a woman who was raised in a very strict Irish Catholic home and went to very strict Irish Catholic schools. Um, and she came out of those experiences, I think, very deeply wounded the, the fasting and abstinence and everything else, uh, she wasn't taught why or, or what, or it was simply we don't eat, you know, we have to eat fish on Friday. It, it, it was interesting. When I became a Catholic, it was an invitation for her. Like she was scratching her head. Why would you become a Catholic? You know, that didn't make any sense. But but there, I'd agree, I agree with you. Obviously, many people had a bad experience of Catholic education prior to the council. And that, being, that, and that, being raised weird. in this very you know, strict, I, I, almost Jansenistic kind of home, yeah. you know? Tom, Tom Monaghan had a very, very positive uh, uh, experience with, uh, with the, the religious sisters that brought him up in, in the orphanage in which, in which he was in. And a, a, a friend of mine who's best man at my wedding, he's now deceased, is a lot older than I was, he was away from the church for 30 or 40 years and he had nothing but wonderful memories of being a Catholic, and he just drifted away in his, you know, in his late teens, twenties. He came back to the church; he didn't recognize it, and it was very difficult because the right. liturgy that he right. went but to, I, I think the ad lib, the ad lib novus ordo, you know, um, right? It doesn't, it doesn't even look like the mass to me, and right. that's a problem, but, right? But I think what I'm getting at is that at the time that the pastors of the church decided to lighten these burdens, so to speak. At, the, at that time, I think what they saw, they must have, or they wouldn't have lightened those burdens. Um, something, some, well, then you're going to presume to know, Joseph, what the motives of well, those no, pastors I, 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 I think were. That I think they had the spirit of the 60s. Hey, yeah. man. We don't need all this stuff. We just need to do our own thing. I think that was that was the problem. Why don't you need someone to tell me I can't eat meat on Fridays? You know, look, I, I think it was all that sort how of many, liberated stuff. But look at how many of us now voluntarily do these things and more. I mean, in other words, most the people don't spirit do of penance. You know That's the problem. Most people on Fridays, most people do nothing different from the rest of the week at the moment. Okay, I'm going to back down. Well, I mean, I... I I, I'm in favor, I guess, in Joseph's side, I'm in favor of having these kind of, you know, formal rules, but then teaching people why we have them so Correct. that we can no longer formal from you. But if you don't have them, 
then the tendency of human nature is to make things easier and easier and easier. That's the way things go. Yeah. Uh, you have to have some bulwark there. You can't keep right. loads but the if ball, we, that doesn't But work. if we, let's, let's remember that when the pastors of the church made this decision to make some of these things voluntary, they were supposed to at the same time, as you just said, Father, teach that they're to be voluntary. So Friday was still to be a day of penance. Somehow that did not get taught. So they removed the one thing people were raised with, not eating meat on Friday, not even realizing why, many of them. Well, uh, we don't know that, but anyway, go ahead. Well, I've met a lot of Catholics in the time I've been a Catholic, lapsed Catholics especially, who didn't understand anything. Okay, so, okay. Okay. Um, and even people who went to Catholic school. So anyway, I'm just saying that when they said we're going to remove the requirement that you don't eat meat on Friday. They also said, if you read the documents, but Friday is the day the Lord died and we are to, in union with the cross, do some kind of voluntary penance. You can continue to abstain from meat or you can do other things. But Somehow that said, part never got something. transmitted. But as Father said, as human nature is such, if you take the rules away, then there's, law there's lawlessness. That's and just to me, it was still law, it was still law to do the, penance on Friday. No, but the thing is, I, it's still law, but the point is, you got people who are academics living in an ivory tower thinking, well, we want to get to the meaning of this, so we're not going to have the rule anymore, but this would tell people, well, do something on Friday, please. I'm sorry, for most people, that's useless. You have I to have... You have to have something external, visible, because, incarnate, and it, yeah, it, it can be it can be mis, it can be misused. But I'm if you don't have going. that, I think it's, it's Gnosticism to think that you can simply say, "Well, you know, Friday's an important day. Do something." No, the, the, it didn't work. As a matter of fact, yeah, the, how many the, besides the, you know that? It's the difference between a suggestion and a rule. They, they, they replaced a wall with a suggestion, right? And, 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 and what happens with suggestions? People say, okay, I'll think about it. And then they, then they don't think about it. <laughs> right, but you... Okay. Go ahead. You know, the reason for all of this, the reason for doing any of this, no meat on Friday, wear a hair shirt if you want to, whip yourself. The reason for doing any of it is because Jesus loves you and you love him. That's right. And it, I agree that pastorally, it's very difficult to um, make rules that will help people internalize this love and to people enforce People have to them. go to Mass on Sundays, Vivian. Pardon? Good people have to go to Mass on Sundays. I don't, okay, I'll tell you this right now. I don't go to Mass on Sundays because it's an obligation of the no, Catholic Church. That was the question. Should it should it be an obligation upon Catholics to go to Mass on Sundays? Regardless I'm of to tell to tell you the off. truth, I'm actually indifferent if it's an obligation or not, because I don't do it because it's an obligation. Well, it's not about you, Vivian. It's not I, about you. I'm just telling you, I operate out of a different I came to the church voluntarily. I embrace the Christian life voluntarily. This idea that I have to do these things because they're laws I also, I isn't came, what so motivates I to, me. Vivian, I came to the church voluntarily from a position of anarchy. And what I wanted was structure. Right? And I think many people today, whether they're, whether they're cradle Catholics or whether they're converts, they're looking for structure. In well, a you know what I'm looking for? Liquid I'm age. Look for something solid. Something solid needs definition. It needs lines. It needs rules. Well, I came to the church looking for love. With a, and with I'm a, not saying that with a love U? and rules are in opposition. I'm a mother of four children. I had to make rules out of love for my children. So somehow these things do need to meet. But I think, you know, the pastors of the church responding to the times, thinking that people, look, there were times in the church where if you committed a serious sin like adultery or something like that, you couldn't just go to confession and go back to communion. You might have to make a pilgrimage barefoot uh, in, a, in, a, in a rough tunic miles away. And, and, and uh, or you might, I mean, I'm saying that there have been different times in church, in the church's history where, where there have been different 
ways of interpreting what people need. And it may be that right now what we need, Joseph and Father, because of what we've just come through, it may be that it's time for more structure and to ring more bells. That may be exactly what we and, need right and, now. And, and, and all for love. And all for love. Yes. It's always been for love. I mean, that, there's no point to have any rules without love. I mean, exactly. if you don't love Jesus, it's all pointless. Exactly. Uh -huh. But I think what happens is these things start to get, at least in people's experience, and it, it's not easy making the rules. No, but you don't have to make them. Just keep them. I mean, I, I, I think now that it was a mistake to be so laxist at the time, but I also thought it at the time. So it's not as if I'm I'm saying, oh, look what happened. Gosh, no, I, I said this is going to happen, and it did happen. I'm not a great prophet, but you don't have to be a prophet just to see, to know that you narcissism cannot be the basis of engendering love. Well, you have I'm to have. I'm not talking about narcissism. Well, well, you know, when I say narcissism, I mean the idea that all you have to do is is think about you have to love, and we have to be, we have to do something penitential. And we make it a little principle, abstract, and it'll that'll touch people. It won't. It's got to be incarnate. There's got to be. There's a reason why you know Jews don't eat pork. Uh, you know what's what's pork? Nothing wrong with pork. But I mean, uh, there's a reason why Muslims don't drink alcohol according to their religion. You know, but I mean, you have to have these kind of things. Right, you do. I'm not disagreeing. I'm not disagreeing. It's just people have to do them for the right reasons too. It's that old trick. It's that old problem with. Yeah. A right action has to be both right object, right, right reason, and so on, right? And, and so it, I'm just saying and pastorally, and you, yeah. and it's you not brought always up your, clear. You, you brought up your children with rules. I did. And you, and you taught them to love through those rules. But yes, you didn't did. try you didn't try to teach them to love without the rules and then put the rules in later. I totally agree with you. That's right. But unfortunately, a lot of people. Well, I, 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 I love this triumvirate that we have, by the way. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> um, we, we managed to have a, I, I, we managed to have about thirty-five minute conversation here, with, and it not really engaging the book too much. We, 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 I mean, we can carry on now for longer, or we can just carry on from where we left off next time. And we, as you say, none of us are in a hurry, so I'm happy to carry on. But, uh, um, but on the other hand, we, we have been going for over half an hour. Well, okay, well, Joseph, we have gotten actually to the very crux of the biscuit here. Yes. <laughs> this is the debate that's going on in the church. Listen, and I and I and I said I love I love this farm for it. I'm very pleased with the conversation, right? Yeah. But I mean, we have been talking for over half an hour, and yeah. I, you know, we can't talk forever. I mean, yeah. Well, we could, but I mean, okay, but <laughs> let's just take one more section because it's very okay. short. Sure. Uh, the in uh, what. Vivian called the incomparable, and I called the incomparable, and I'm sure they're both right. Uh, but incomparable, I'm saying, is, incomparable is English, as in British, so that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to, because, because as Vivian said, what is his answer? Immediately, it's the incomparable Jesus Christ. That's the answer we have to look at. Yes. But I want to just point out the very last part of this section, page 31. Uh, this is incomparable as an offer and as a chance or opportunity. If one falls out of it, one sinks back into Jewish messianism, messianisms, and pagan paths of flight from the world. This is going to be a theme throughout throughout some upcoming chapters here. That there's this there's this kind of double uh, desire on the part of man. Uh, Jewish messianism means. You don't accept the Messiah anymore. It's secular. We want it. we want to have the utopia that we're going to bring in the class of society. But Eastern meditation is flee the world and join God. You know, and he's going to say these are natural desires of man. You know, a future, a better future, but also something transcendent. And the thing is, if you split them up, like it has happened, uh, you don't get either one. Right. And so right. we'll we'll that's right. We'll discuss that starting next week with Perfect. Why Still Christianity on page 32. How's that sound? And we're still going to aim to stick to the – it doesn't matter if you don't, but, but basically if it's just to tell people we're still hoping to finish the chapter on partial identification. I would even go be, go to the cross for us. Okay. All right. Let's, let's read to the end of the cross for us. Page 89. All right. 
Thanks, everybody, for if anybody's still here listening to us. But we had a good time. So see you next week. God bless you. Bye.